Tonight, a symbol of recovery. The long-delayed Tokyo 2020 Summer Olympics gets underway as Sri Lanka begins its campaign in three events tomorrow. Shocking developments. MP Badiuddin's spouse arrested in underage domestic death on charges of cruelty and human trafficking as more revelations surface. While serving as a domestic servant at the official residence of the minister, she was raped by the brother-in-law of the ex-minister. Will it work? 23 more Delta variant cases added to the list as authorities announce resumption of limited interprovincial travel from the 1st of August. A dark day. Today marks 38 years since the deadly Black July riots marred the country's social landscape. All this and much more coming up on this Friday, the 23rd of July 2021. From Adha Derana, this is Adha Derana First at Nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Shanela Fernando in your top stories for tonight. Postponed by a global pandemic last year, the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games opening ceremony was held today with guests and spectators limited to under a thousand who stood and observed a moment of silence for the global victims of the COVID-19 pandemic. Sri Lanka has fielded a nine-member team this year who will compete in seven sports beginning tomorrow when shuttler Niluka Karuna Ratna, shooter Tehani Egodavela and swimmer Anika Gafur take part in their respective heats. The long-delayed 2020 Summer Olympics finally got underway at the Olympic Stadium in Tokyo today. Kicked off with a dazzling fireworks display, the fact that it is being held one year late in 2021 is probably the best example of how far and deep the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the world. Accordingly, the ceremony started off with a moment's silence observed for all victims of COVID-19 and Olympians unable to attend this year due to pandemic restrictions. The moment was observed by Japan's Emperor Naruhito and International Olympics Committee President Thomas Bach. The theme of the opening ceremony this year is moving forward, with the entertainment too designed around the struggle for not only Japan, but the rest of the world to recover from the challenges of the global pandemic. This year's Tokyo Olympics will feature 11,427 athletes, representing 204 countries and competing in 339 events for honours in 33 sports. Spectator numbers and dignitaries have also been limited to witness the opening ceremony, with official figures putting attendance at 950. Sri Lanka! Sri Lanka! Sri Lanka, meanwhile, has fielded a team of nine athletes this year, led by team captain Shamara Nuandarma Vardhana, who was the official flag bearer as well. As usual, hundreds of millions of people around the world watching the live stream were treated to the highlight of the ceremony with the colourful march passed by the 204 teams. Sri Lanka's team are set to compete in seven sports including equestrian, track and field, badminton, swimming, judo, shooting and for the first time in Sri Lanka's Olympic history, artistic gymnastics. Sri Lanka's athletes are set to begin their games tomorrow with Niluka Karuna Ratna, Tehani Agravela and Anika Gafur competing in the badminton, shooting and 100-meter butterfly events respectively. Police today arrested the wife of MP Rishad Badiuddin, his father-in-law and another person in connection with the death of a 16-year-old domestic worker at the parliamentarian's residence. Meanwhile, the brother-in-law of the MP was also taken into police custody today on accusations of sexually abusing another maid who was employed at the MP's residence during his tenure as a minister of the previous government. This incident came to light during inquiries carried out into the death of the 16-year-old child. 
A 16-year-old domestic worker at former Minister Richard Badiuddin's residence had set herself on fire on the 3rd of this month, following which she was rushed to hospital. She died last week as a result of her severe burn injuries. However, the real shocker was her post-mortem results, which revealed that she had been sexually abused for a prolonged period. As part of the investigations, the spouse of MP Rishad Badiuddin, 46-year-old Shihabdin Aisha, was summoned to the Borella police yesterday and was interrogated for over six hours. Recording her statement, police moved to arrest her this morning under charges of cruelty and human trafficking. Her father, Mohammad Shihabdin, was also apprehended by the police in connection with the case, along with an intermediary who the police refer to as the child trafficker under charges of abetting the incident. According to the police, it was revealed that the arrested middleman had employed several other children as domestic workers at the Badiuddin residence. According to the investigation and the evidence collected as scientific, circumstantial and technical evidence, it has been revealed that two offences have been committed in respect of the girl. The offences are human trafficking and in addition to that, a cruelty to children. Accordingly, wife of the ex-minister, the suspect would be produced before the Colombo magistrate today and police are seeking to obtain a detention order for a period of 72 hours and Colombo South Crime Detective Bureau, Colombo South Children and Women Bureau and Borella Police are jointly conducting further investigations into the incident. In the meantime, the brother-in-law of MP Badiuddin was also arrested by the Borella Police today for having sexually abused another female staffer at the MP's official residence in Colombo during his tenure as a minister. The information came to light when two women aged 22 and 32 who had been employed at the MP's residence were questioned over the death of 16-year-old Ishalini. Police revealed that the 22-year-old had suffered sexual abuse at the hands of the MP's brother-in-law, Shihabdin Ismadeen. While she was serving as a domestic servant at the official residence of the Minister Mackenzie Road, Colombo, she was raped by the brother-in-law of the ex-minister. Accordingly, investigation team has arrested the suspect identified as Shihabdin Ismadeen, 44-year-old person. The suspect would be produced before the Colombo magistrate. Further investigations are conducted in addition to the investigation of the death of the 16-year-old girl. 38 years ago today, Sri Lanka marked one of the darkest days in its entire history. On the 23rd of July 1983, mobs of politically backed Sinhalese writers attacked and burned down Tamil-owned properties and businesses across the country and killing up to 3,000 members of the Sri Lankan Tamil community. The day is remembered as the spark that ignited an almost 30-year-long conflict that alienated thousands more Tamil families in the country, with thousands having to flee the country into exile. On the 23rd of July 1983, the ambush of a Sri Lanka army petrol in Tirunel Valley Jaffna by members of the fledgling LTTE terror group resulted in the death of 15 soldiers, including one officer. The ambush carried out in retaliation to the alleged killing of LTT operative Charles Anthony by the army turned the country into a powder keg of ethnic tensions at the time. There are questions, however, whether a decision by the government led by President J.R. Javardana and Prime Minister Ranasinghe Premadasa to go against the tradition of handing over the remains of fallen soldiers to their families and instead hold a public funeral at the General Cemetery in Borella was an intentional act, especially at a time when the then government was standing on very thin ice. Meanwhile, growing restless due to a delay in transporting the soldiers' remains, the estimated 8,000 people who had descended upon the Borala Cemetery on 24th July 1983 from there on went on a rampage, spurred on by the agendas of Colombo's political bigwigs. The result was the darkest days in Sri Lanka's history, with up to 3,000 Tamils killed, hundreds of family homes burnt down, and hundreds more Tamil businesses destroyed. By the time a curfew was declared by President J.R. Javardana, however, it was already too late. The damage had already been done. 
Innocent Tamil citizens across the country were seen pulled out of their homes, workplaces and vehicles and brutally killed by rioters who left their bodies littering the streets. However, such xenophobic attitudes of the politically motivated mobs who rampaged that day were not shared by the majority of Sri Lankans. Hundreds of Tamil families fearing for their lives were sheltered and protected by Sinhalese, Muslim and Burger families in their homes, saving possibly thousands of lives. When the violence was brought under control by the army almost a week later, over 50,000 Tamils were rendered homeless, their entire lives destroyed and left with no other option but to move north to Jaffna or seek exile in foreign countries. Today, 12 years after the end of the war, Sri Lanka's wounds have healed to a great extent. However, the scars of that dreadful period are still visible in the memories of those who lived through that period. More news on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Big Three. Welcome back in more news. Sri Lanka's overall Delta variant cases surged past 60 today after 23 more COVID-19 patients were confirmed today. The National Operations Centre for the Prevention of COVID-19 made this announcement today and added that reports placed the cases in six districts. The Operations Centre also announced that it has authorised inter-provincial public transport to resume in a limited manner from the 1st of August despite the travel restrictions. Sri Lanka's overall number of Delta variant cases rose by 23 more infections today. The National Operations Center for the Prevention of COVID-19 confirmed this today and stated that this development raises the total infections identified to date to 61. The Operations Center stated that reports suggested that the new cases have been detected from Colombo, Damulla, Vaunia, Mulativ, Kilinochi and Nigamo areas. As the country enters a long weekend, Police media spokesperson DIG Ajit Rohana says that the next three days could mark a crucial juncture for the country. The DIG added that ultimately it will be the public's behaviour that will once again decide if further lockdowns are necessary or not. As such, he urged the general public to act responsibly. The Western Province Senior DIG has deployed 30 special teams in order to conduct operations in respect of the persons who disobey with the face mask concept and social distancing concept. In addition to that, the provincial restriction order remains as it is. Therefore, the general public are not allowed to cross provincial borders. 13 Entry and exit points have been manned by Sri Lanka police to check the persons who are moving through the provincial borders. Accordingly, uh, yesterday 7,662 persons have been checked by the police uh, and uh, 168 persons have been sent back to their original places as they were trying to cross the borders violating quarantine rules and regulations. We are conducting continuous uh, quarantine operations and we have deployed approximately 10,000 officers to conduct patrols in their respective areas. So therefore, all the times obey with quarantine rules and regulations. In other developments, State Minister of Vehicle Regulation, Bus Transport Services and Train Compartments, Dilum Amunagama, revealed today that the National Operations Centre for the Prevention of COVID-19 has given authorization for the commencement of limited inter-provincial travel from the 1st of August. Goes to following the city, Santana Sima Ivat Kiruat Nogala, Palatatra Yam, Basta Pramanak, Sam Dumbre Pramana Dao Negrana, Covid coming to Abida, Hogi Rasri Medi, Anumatia Dun, and Isa Palatatra Sima Sahamuling Ivat Kiruat, Simita Vaname, Apisama and Vidira Dao Negar, by Sima Ivat Nogarut, Simita Yam Pramana, Palatatra Dao Negrana, maybe Nogara Abida was a reliability. In the meantime, 1,721 COVID 19 infections were reported across the country yesterday by the Epidemiology Unit. Once again, the Western Province recorded the highest infections with 774 COVID-19 cases. District-wise, the Colombo District topped the daily case list with 347 infections. The second highest infections were reported from the Gampa District with 218 cases, while Kalutar recorded 209. In addition, seven imported cases were also part of the list. As for today, 1,310 new COVID-19 cases have been confirmed so far. Meanwhile, the recovery of 953 COVID-19 patients today pushed the overall number of recoveries to 265,708. 
with vaccinations identified as the only known successful method to counter the COVID-19 virus. Sri Lanka's health authorities have raced against time to inoculate 30% of the country's eligible population with at least one vaccine dose. The lion's share of the inoculations carried out in the country had been carried out with the Chinese-manufactured Sinopharm vaccine. With Sri Lanka confirming over 50 Delta variant patients from random samples obtained across the country, the risk of experiencing a massive surge in Delta variant cases, similar to that of India, seems to be growing. Taking to Twitter, Director of the Department of Immunology and Molecular Medicine of the University of Sri Jayavardhanapura, Professor Chandima Jeevandra, revealed that the viral load is roughly 1,000 times higher in people infected with the Delta variant. Professor Jeevandra made these remarks in reference to a Chinese study currently in preprint, which compared the viral load present in the Delta variant to the viral load identified from strands earlier last year. However, the only assurance and best line of defence Sri Lankan people have against this variant and all versions of COVID-19 is a national vaccine programme. On this front, the country does not fall short as authorities have been able to inoculate over 6.5 million people over the age of 30 with at least one dose. According to the data presented by the Ministry of Health, 29.84% of the country's vaccine-eligible population has been administered with at least one dose. A majority of the first-dose vaccinations have been carried out using the Sinopharm vaccine, which accounts for over 4.8 million of the overall vaccinations. The number of people to have been fully immunized against COVID-19 is now over 1.7 million. Meanwhile, yesterday health authorities administered 87,438 first doses of the Sinopharm vaccine, while 13,255 people were vaccinated with the second dose of the same vaccine. Further, 16,628 Pfizer vaccines were administered in the National Vaccination Program yesterday. In addition, 116,399 Moderna vaccines were administered in the Kent District. With Sri Lanka set to experience showers above 75 millimetres and gusty winds with speeds up to 60 kilometres per hour, especially in the western slopes of the central hills, the Department of Meteorology says that the weather conditions are expected to dim down from tomorrow. Nevertheless, naval and fishing communities were advised against venturing into sea areas spanning from Gaul to Potuville and from Putlam to Trincomalee via Mana due to rough seas. The southwest monsoon condition is currently active over the country once again. The Department of Meteorology stated today that showers or thunder showers will occur at times in the western, Savargamo and central provinces in the Gaul and Mathara district. Fairly heavy showers of about 75 mm can be expected at some areas in the Savargamo province and in the Nurelia, Gaul and Mathara districts. Due to active southwest monsoon conditions over Sri Lanka, we are already experiencing fairly strong gusty winds across the island. The wind speed can increase up to 60 km per hour over western slopes of the central hills, northern, north central and northwestern and southern provinces as well as in Trincomalee district. From tomorrow onwards, slight reduction can be expected. Sea areas extending from Gaul to Potuville via Hambantota and Puttalam to Trincomalee via uh, Mana can be very rough at times. So fishing and naval communities are requested to be vigilant in this regard. Regarding the shower conditions, fairly heavy falls above 75 mm can be expected tonight over western slopes of the central east. The remaining parts of the southwestern quarter also there can be showers at times. But however, we expect some sort of reduction of showery conditions from tomorrow onwards. Today, Buddhist devotees celebrate the Asala Full Moon Poya Day, a day, a day rather that marks a series of significant events, including the conception of Prince Siddhartha, as well as the beginning of his journey towards enlightenment. Unlike the Vesak and Posun Poya Days, this time around, devotees were able to visit temples and engage in religious activities. Asala Full Moon Poyo is a significant day for Sri Lanka's Buddhist faithful as the sacred day marks a series of important events including the conception of Prince Siddhartha as well as the day he gave up his lay life, donned the robes of an ascetic and went on a journey in search of enlightenment. Asala Poyo also marks the beginning of the rainy season retreat for bhikkhus or Vaskalaya. 
Buddhist worshippers from all over the country were seen gathered at temples today, engaging in religious observances. Unlike Vesak and Posun Poe holidays this year, the time around devotees were once again able to gather at temples and worship, however, in accordance with health guidelines. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa and opposition leader Sajid Premadasa too attended religious observances during the day. In the meantime, a ceremony was held to lay a foundation stone for a bell tower at the sacred Sandagiri Mahasaya in Hantana today, which also included the unveiling of a Buddha statue flown down from Vietnam. Meanwhile, the final procession of the Ruhunu Kataragama Mahadevale will take to the streets tonight in line with COVID health guidelines. The procession will come to a close tomorrow morning and will be followed by the traditional water cutting ceremony. We'll return after this short commercial break. Don't go away. Welcome back in international news. An advisor to the French government on the COVID-19 eradication efforts had stated that people may not be able to return to their normal lives until 2022 or sometimes even after 2023. Meanwhile, New Zealand today stated that the bio-travel bubble currently in existence with Australia would be paused as their neighbour battles an outbreak of the Delta variant. India's eastern city of Kolkata converted a train coach into a vaccination centre for railway staff amid an immunisation drive in the country. The federal government aims to inoculate all the country's estimated 944 million adults by December, a target health experts have said is ambitious. So far, India has administered 423,417,030 doses, with less than 10% getting the mandatory two doses. India opened free vaccination for all adults starting from the 21st of June when the country administered a record 8 million plus doses in a day. Since then, the inoculation drive for daily doses has seen a downward trend. A return to normal life following the COVID-19 virus outbreak may not occur until 2022 or even 2023, said Professor Jean Francois Delfrezi, who advises the French government today. Delfrezi also told a local media outlet that France could reach around 50,000 new daily COVID-19 cases by the beginning of August and warned against going to nightclubs despite their reopening. Further, yesterday he said that the fourth wave of new coronavirus infections should hit French hospitals in the second half of August. The Delta variant is now dominant in France and authorities reported 21,909 new COVID-19 cases in the country over the previous 24 hours. New Zealand will pause quarantine-free travel with Australia for at least eight weeks from tonight as Australia battles an outbreak of the highly infectious Delta virus variant. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern today suspended the travel bubble with Australia, which allows movement between the two countries without quarantine. The arrangement had already been paused for travellers to and from New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. Total infections in Australia's worst outbreak since the peak of the pandemic last year have jumped to just over 1,900 since the first case was detected in a Sydney limousine driver transporting international flight crews in mid-June. Haiti leads it, its late President Jovenel Moise to rest today amid protests from angry supporters of the slain leader in his hometown. Moise was gunned down in his home in Port-au-Prince earlier this month, setting off a political crisis, a crisis rather, in the Caribbean country, already struggling with poverty and lawlessness. Overnight, yesterday, labourers set up stages, lights and paved a brick road to Moise's mausoleum on a dusty plot of several acres enclosed by high walls in the northern city of Cap Haitian. Meanwhile, protests convulsed the city for a second successive day. Yesterday's demonstration saw protesters set tires on fire to block roads. Government officials say Moise was murdered by a team of mostly Colombian mercenaries, but many questions remain unanswered, including why the president's security forces did not do more to protect him. With that, we wrap up tonight's edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining. I'm Shanella Fernando. Have a good night.